Hi, Rod Fleming in the Philippines here, and I hope you're all well. I am sorry if I'm being a little bit inconsistent and delaying in getting these videos out to you. The fact is I have a, quite a number of other things to do. Um, I'm a bit busy. And actually, formulating these, uh, these essays, I guess, these visual essays, uh, takes quite a long time because I have to kind of plan them and think them through. And I know it all sounds like it just comes all this off, off the cuff like that, but there's a considerable amount of preparation that goes into each one of these videos. And sometimes they can take, you know, three or four days. Um, okay, I'm probably thinking about other things as well during those three or four days, but it can take quite a long time to, to put one together. So my apologies, and I hope you find that when you actually get them, that they're worthwhile. I've been putting little snippet posts in my YouTube posts page. I don't know how many of you look at that. And there are a few other things we'll come to, uh, maybe in another video, that, 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 that I've been doing. Anyway, today I want to talk about the problems that we're having with young transsexuals. Now, please, let us be quite clear here. I'm not talking about transgenders. I'm not talking about transgenders. I'm not talking about people who think they might be non-binary. I'm talking about people who actually have gender dysphoria, or they would have gender dysphoria if they continued as they are and they need to transition. We've discussed this before, and there are two basic types. There's homosexual transsexuals and non-homosexual transitioners. Both, let me be quite clear, are equally valid. There's no, there's no hierarchy here. It's just that they are slightly different. And we've explained or we've discussed why, and we might go into it again. Just now, I'm a little bit concerned. In fact, I'm a lot more than a little bit concerned because the forces of darkness, the gender crits and the TERFs, uh, and their allies, and unfortunately, they are proving very good at influencing gullible uh, journalists who know nothing, nothing about this subject are beginning to use psychiatrists and psychologists to back their case up that there should be no transition. And let's be quite clear. TERFs are, and gender crits are quite simple. They don't want anyone to transition. They are against it. They don't want it. They have adopted the position that the old religious right held maybe 25 years ago, 30 years ago, where in regard to homosexuality, they just don't want to see it happen at all, and they will adduce any argument from any source that they hope will help them out. And of course, of course, these are despicable people, um, but we'll get into why. Now, I spend quite a lot of time, or I have spent quite a lot of time, explaining to people what the current state of science is, and I hope, I've always hoped, reasonably understandable terms to explain to people how it is, what's going on, what transsexualism, transgenderism, transition, all the things, what they are, what causes them, um, so that people will both understand others who have it and understand themselves. And I certainly know from my mail inbox that a, a significant number of, of people, particularly AGPs, autogynophiles, have found these very helpful because, you know, they come on asking me for help, which I'm usually willing to give. Although sometimes it can get a little long-winded, you know. Anyway, that is informational. That's just telling you what is going on and what is actually happening. That doesn't have anything to do, really, with whether people should be transitioning. Okay? And... When the gender crits and the TERFs, otherwise known as the scum of the earth, use these, the, 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 um, the scientists and the papers and the, the psychiatrists and psychologists that they do, they're not doing it to inform. They're doing it for the very specific reason that they want all of this to stop. What they fail to understand, and it is a really big issue, is that it's not their choice. It's not Kellyanne Keen Mitchell's choice to decide who's going to transition. It is not J.K. Rowling's choice to decide who's going to transition. It is not, I don't know how many airbrained idiots in the United States, the true, the real 
mother load of bad ideas, by the way, to decide what other people do. I'm a libertarian, right? That means I believe that everyone has the right sovereignty over their own body. They have the right to deal with it as they choose and to live as they choose, as long as they don't harm anyone else or prevent them from doing the same. Well, that's it. So I will not tolerate, I will not countenance any idiot using perfectly viable, well, actually misusing perfectly legitimate scientific papers to try to prove a political point. There is a difference between science and politics. And what these people are doing is putting the two in the same basket and saying, well, oh, the science says this, so the politics must follow. Because they have the particular politics. They don't want transition to happen, so they try to, um, they try to maximize the, uh, the effect of uh, questioning papers. And they always read the papers that they do read in an entirely negative way. It's biased, right? And we'll come back to that in another video. Just now I want to talk about the young people involved. Now, this is where we get to the catch line, right? <laughs> in 1982, a woman, an English woman by the name of Victoria Gillick, who's Catholic, and she had five children under the age of 16 at the time. She's become very prominent in politics, but at that time she was unheard of, but she was a woman, a perfectly ordinary mother, with five kids, um, all under 16, all girls, and one of them went to ask the doctor about contraceptive pills. And the doctor presided them without telling the mother. And the mother hit the roof and took the local health authority, which in Britain, you know, it's a, it's a state-run health service, which, well, anyway, um, it does mean that it goes to a, a kind of local board who actually employ doctors. And at that time, I think it would have been the, because it's a long time ago, you know, 40 years, I think then it would have been the local authority, but I, you know, I could be wrong with that. I don't want to go in there. Anyway, the uh, the local authority said no, and we're not having this, and they uh, they, they fought the uh, the action, Victoria Gillick's action, in court. The, the the suit proposed that doctors did not have the right to prescribe contraceptives to girls under the age of sixteen without informing the parents, or actually without consulting the parents. Now, the first court that, that, that heard this agreed with the local authority and the doctors that said no. No, the doctors have a perfect right to do this. Victoria Gillick is not the kind of person to back down easily. So she appealed and the appeal court backed her up. They said, no, 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 wait a minute. The, the parents' rights have to be considered here too and the parents must be informed. It then went, because it had now become a subject of national importance and the, the government generally was involved by this stage, because at the end of the day, they're the ones who fund the, uh, the health service. They decided that they were going to appeal again, and they were given leave to, and they were going to appeal to the highest body in the land, which at that time was called the, the House of Lords sitting as a court of law. And just briefly, to let you understand, the British system was always, until I think it was 2005, was always that the most senior judges were given the title Law Lords, right? Now, they did actually sit in the House of Lords. When we, talk about, when we talked about a case going to the House of Lords, it did not mean that the entirety of the ermine-clad ones had a voice in this. It just meant that the Law Lords were going to sit physically in the, the, the House of Lords, but as a court of law. So you would normally have three very senior judges, right? The most experienced legal professions, professionals in the country would hear the case and make a decision. This was uh, supplanted for no damn good reason at all, except for his natural nastiness by uh, Tony Blair when he put in place the, the British, uh, the, the British uh, Supreme Court, which hopefully we'll, get, we'll manage to get rid of. Anyway... What happened was that Gillick was thrown out, essentially. That the position was upheld, that a doctor had the right to prescribe contraceptive pills to a girl under 16 without telling the parents. 
right? Now, that's a really important thing because in Britain, the age of consent is 16. And this was the whole point of the action. The action had said this person was not competent. Not only was she not competent to decide whether or not to have sex, it would be illegal for her to have sex. And so doctors shouldn't have done it. Well, the, the highest court in the land said, mm, sorry, no. They, they argued that the interest of the child, or the young person in this case, had to come first. It outweighed the specific legal technicalities, right, of age of consent. That it was more important that this person was given contraceptives so that she would not become pregnant, right, than that she should be sent packing and told to bring her mum the next time. Which she obviously wasn't going to do. The, the, the thinking being very clearly, and it was expressed at great length in, in the court, that what was going to happen was that these girls were just going to go and have sex anyway and get pregnant. And did you really want to have all these uh, underage pregnancies, these teenage pregnancies going on? You know, teenage pregnancy is something that happens. It happens everywhere. You know, it's not, you know, this idea that, that, that people under the age of 18 don't have sex is complete baloney. And we need to really stand on it because it's so stupid. Anyway, what happened was that Gillick, the Gillick case was thrown out. But it was thrown out on the basis of an understanding that competency, right, legal competency, competency that is the ability for a young person to make a decision right, was staged. It was not absolute. It didn't just happen at a particular age, right? It would something that would develop through time, and it depended on the individual. Some individuals would be more competent than others. Some individuals, frankly, and I know a few, are never competent. Some, by the age of 12 or 13, are competent to make decisions about a great many things, you know? they are actually that mature. And the argument, therefore, was this has to be taken into account. Is this young person fit to make decisions like this? And in um, the, the one, it wasn't actually a, a, a dissenting judgment, but it was um, a different opinion, uh, Lord Fraser set a, out a, a set of guidelines. And so the two together are often called the Gillick-Fraser guidelines, but that's kind of wrong because Gillick competency is a, a measure of, of the competency of the individual. Fraser guidelines are guidelines for how professionals would treat that individual. So they're, they're really quite different. You know, the, the, the Fraser guidelines basically outline that, that in really, really blunt terms, and I know, okay, so Amanda, I know you're going to get me for this, but anyway, basically outline that doctors can't go beyond the level of competency under Gillick that a young person has, right? They can't do it, right? But if that person has demonstrated competency, then they're obliged to act in the interests of the child and not necessarily to inform the, the parent. If the child doesn't want the parent involved, that's it. Um, I do have to say that w within the Fraser guidelines, sorry, it's the chair, it's very clear that where any suggestion of endangerment to the child, domestic abuse or anything at all like that is, is actually even hinted at, then the relevant authorities must be contacted, right? The doctor just has to get on the phone and say, look, I think I've got a problem here. How can we put this? It's, a, it's rather a comprehensive package which defines the rights of the individual young person, but also the rights and responsibilities of the professionals dealing with her or him. Now, this was delivered in 1985, I believe. Um, what you have to understand is that this particular case was about the prescription of contraceptive pills to a minor, someone under the age of 16, and whether it was appropriate for that to happen without telling the parent. And the, the court in the UK, the highest court in the land, decided that it was, under a particular set of circumstances, that was okay, that could happen. Now, first thing to notice is that had 
the, 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 the young person, the girl, had her mother, Victoria Gillick, who's a person I admire, by the way, had she gone into the doctors with her daughter and said, look, I'm not very happy about this, but, you know, I think it's probably appropriate that you, you do prescribe these pills for my daughter. The doctor, would, the doctor would just have said yes, and there would have been no issue. It would be fine. And the Fraser guidelines, again, make this clear that where a parent is in support of the child's decision, or the young person's decision, then th there's no further interest on the part of the law. That's fine. The legal guardian has made a decision which concurs with the decision that the young person has taken. And if that person is competent under Gillick, <laughs> do you see what I mean? Then that's it. No more argument, right? Why is that important when we're talking about trans, trans people? Because many trans people begin their transition under the age of 16 or 18. And in the UK, 16 has become this, you know, very silly um, line in the sand drawn by gender crits and TERFs, the scum of the earth, under which they're saying, no, 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 you can't do anything because they're not competent. But the fact is that Gillick Fraser tells you they are competent. And not only does it tell you they are competent, or they might be, I mean, some might not be, but there's still the, the possibility that they will be. And if they are, Fraser tells you, the Fraser guidelines tell you, the doctor has to do it has to go along with it. The doctor has to accept that the competency of the young person in regard to the medica medication and medical care that he's getting, he or she is getting, is enough, right? And get, Fraser even goes further and basically says, you know, if you take your mum with you and she agrees, that's it. There's no further debate here, no argument. The doctors are really obliged to go ahead with it. And I'm bringing this up because the gender crits have, are, they, these are a despicable group of people. These are really, really nasty people who believe that they have the right to decide for other people how to live their lives. And that's something that I cannot abide. I absolutely cannot stand people like that. You do not, Kellyanne Keen Mitchell, you do not have the right to decide for other people how to live. J.K. Rowling, you do not have the right to decide for other people how they live and get it through your thick little heads that you will never have that right. You don't have it, you ain't going to get it. So here's the point. When we look at young people, or it's point one, and I'll come do another video to explain point two. When we look at young people who are uh, pre-transsexual, that is, you know, they've been showing what's called gender non-conforming, but it's actually sex non-conforming behavior, right? Because they're not behaving in the way that you would expect a person of that sex to behave from maybe four years old or even younger, and that's been established, it's insistent, it's persistent, it's consistent, it's kept going on for years. By the time they're 13, and if they pass the, sta the, the Gillick standards of competency, in fact, even 12, because the WPATH, the, the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, doesn't make a, an age statement. If they pass the, 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 the standards of competency, then yes, they get the treatment that they want. And you people are going to have to get into your heads that this is the case. And that arsing about the way you do is not going to change it. You have huge amounts of law against you. And the law is not showing any inclination to change. Right? So we know, we can tell by the time a genuinely pre-transsexual child is 13, whether that or not that child is going to go on to be transsexual. And trying to persuade them not to be, trying them to persuade them to be gay men, which is something I'll also uh, address, is completely immoral and it's abusive. It's absolutely abusive. It's conversion therapy. That's all it is. What Ken Zucker was doing was conversion therapy. And he can sue me if he likes. That's what he was trying to do. He was trying to persuade young people that they weren't actually transsexual, that they were gay instead. Why is gay better? Why would gay be better? Than transsexual. Why would it be better to have to live in a, a subculture that's notorious for drug abuse, substance abuse, personal abuse, emotional abuse, physical abuse, hugely high levels of promiscuity? You name it, across the board. It's a terrible culture. Why would we condemn children, young people, to have to live in that when they could just be women? Get married 
and disappear. Somebody somewhere explain how that can be morally justified, because I can't see it. I can't see it. What I see is a lot of people virtue signaling towards the gay lobby. Well, the fact is, too bad. Just too bad. You're not, the gays are not the only people with rights. Transsexual, young pre-transsexuals have rights too. And as I've said, they are able to exercise those rights legally. And you know, certainly I know that this, uh, you know, the United States is the heart of darkness, man. But across uh, the United Kingdom, Australia, New Zealand, large parts of the, the world, the Gillick Fraser, the Gillick Standards of Competency, Competency and the Fraser Guidelines have been adopted right, into laws across the planet. So that's what I want to say today. I'm sick fed up of hearing terrorists complaining about, oh, they're not really competent to make a decision. Yes, they bloody well are, and the law says so. Okay? Toodaloo. See you soon. <laughs>